Thanks, okay. All right, good morning. Good morning, good morning. It is good to see you all this morning. Uh, I haven't been here in a couple of weeks, so missed you, and I'm glad myself to be off the road and to be back with you this week. Um, again, happy Father's Day to all our fathers here, um, uh, that you may be blessed today with your family and your children and your wives, um, and also just be in prayer for the Axon family as they are traveling uh, for the next couple of weeks uh, to go see their son, Eli. Uh, we're going to pick up today uh, in Luke chapter 13, uh, where Pastor Preston left off. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit on verses 10 through 17 uh, today. Um, this passage is about Jesus, once again, who is performing a miracle uh, by healing a woman. And as I've said many, many times, uh, as we study the Gospels, uh, that there's much that we learn about what Jesus has to say. There's much we can learn from what Jesus actually does. Because uh, remember, the Bible says that he operated in the power of spirit and truth, that he not only said it, but he did it. So let us dive in here, uh, Luke chapter 13, and I'm going to read verses 10 through 17, which will be our focus text today. In verse 10, he says, uh, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. But then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, do not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it. Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed? From this bond on the Sabbath day. And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all people rejoiced at the glorious things that were done by him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are our deliverer. That if we are to come to you, that we have this promise that you will cast none away that you would not turn us away, but that we would see a change in our life that deliver us forever and ever. So I pray, Father, Lord, as we go through your word today, that we hold fast to this truth in our everyday lives, that we know that you are with us, that you are for us, and only in you is the answers that we need in this life and eternity for our true deliverance. We pray this, pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we read the Gospels, as we read the Bible, as we even understand our life, even as a Christian, you could be a non-Christian to understand this, that in this life, trial and tribulation will abound. And remember, Jesus told his disciples in John 16, he says that you will have much tribulation in this life, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And because Christ has overcome the world, those who are found in him have victory over this life in him. Now, in general, we suffer, we will experience suffering in three, probably three major categories. Natural disasters, right? You know, we experience earthquakes and famines and plagues, and we had the pandemic. You know, we have tsunamis and tornadoes. You know, you can almost call Texas heat an infliction of natural disasters, all these various things. But we suffer uh, things of natural, of environmental things. The second area that we suffer in in this life is bodily afflictions, right? You know, we, we get to a place when we're young, we think we're invisible until we start getting older. 
And all of a sudden, we start feeling it in our knees and our backs and more doctor visits and all these various things. We can feel our bodies slowly but surely kind of wasting away. So we, in this life, we experience physical infirmities, chronic sicknesses, diseases, and most importantly, all of us experience death. And number three, the other thing that we suffer in this life is spiritual impairment. Spiritual impairment. In other words, we all have indwelling sin that is in us, that has made a mess of our lives and those around us that we deal with. And even as a Christian, we still have sin that the spirit that is dwelling is wrestling with on a day-to-day basis. So these are three areas that we suffer with. And why do we suffer with these things? Because remember, uh, the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve. It was their disobedience that opened the door wide for sin and death to enter into the creation in which you and, I, you and I now live in. Okay, And God's response from heaven for our predicament is Jesus. And in him, the Father saves that which is lost. He redeems that which is enslaved. He restores dignity to that which has been degraded, that which has been debased. And so Paul taught that in Adam, all have died. Okay, he is the first Adam. But then there's a second Adam, which is Jesus, that everyone who is in Jesus, that Jesus uh, has restored us to new life. He is the second, the greater Adam. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 through 22, Paul says, For as by a man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all may be made alive. And so when we start going through our focus text, we see Jesus, who is the second Adam, who lives out this gospel truth that everyone that comes in contact with him is changed, is healed, is delivered forever. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to spotlight today the works of Jesus and how it impacts us. So in verse 10, pretty much just kind of offers our opening scene, right? So Jesus is teaching in the, in the Sabbath. Now, big picture, based on where we are in the Gospels, uh, Jesus is kind of he's nearing the end of his gospel ministry. He maybe has about several more months before his eventual crucifixion. Okay, but as usual, when Jesus was around, his enemies were also present as they persisted in trapping him in his words, and they attempted always to instigate arguments and disputes with him. And as recorded in several places in the Gospels, you see that they always took issue with him doing works, what they call works, on the Sabbath. Okay? And their accusations, as we already know, were hypocritical. As they did, as they did not observe the law of God concerning the Sabbath, but instead, here's what they did. They consistently applied a perverted understanding of the law to trap Jesus. And remember, one of the primary issues that the Pharisees and scribes had with Jesus was what was operating was jealousy, envy. You know, every time I read this passage, I think about Daniel. Y'all remember Daniel? Daniel chapter 6, remember he was one of the highest advisors in the kingdom of King Darius of the Persian Empire. And in Daniel chapter 6, all those other advisors were jealous of him. And they tried so many ways to trap him, but they couldn't. Why? Because the Bible says that in Daniel was the spirit of excellence. They could not find anything. So what did they have to do? They had to go and they had to find some way to trap him with his God. They knew Daniel went and devoted himself to prayer three times a day. And so we'll trap him with that. So they had the king write this edict that no one should pray to anybody but the king on these days, all while knowing that Daniel was going to remain devoted to God. And so you see a lot of this same jealousy with Jesus as they have to try to twist the scriptures and twist all these different things and heap on these man traditions to trap Jesus. And so in verse 11, verse 11, it says, And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. You know, straighten herself. And so one of the things that, you know, that I mentioned in my prayer and that we learn about Jesus is that it's important to understand that we are to seek him while he may be found. We are to call on God while he is near. And then you see that Jesus, remember, he's in a synagogue, he's preaching a sermon, he is teaching. 
And this woman comes into synagogue at that moment because they know that Jesus, she knows Jesus is there. Okay? She comes in and she enters synagogue, and the Bible says that she has a disabling spirit. Or depending on which English translation that you're working with, it would often say a spirit of infirmity. A spirit of infirmity. Now, she had a deformity of her bones, primarily of the spine. Now, compared to if that woman, you know, was around today and she was going to a doctor, it's possible she might be diagnosed with something like spondylitis, which is a degenerative disease of the spine and its major joints when they begin to fuse together, which decreases flexibility in the spine. Further, such a condition produced a hunched posture, which, which a person was unable to sit and stand straightly. And remember, Luke notes in his gospel, that this woman suffered this condition for 18 years. And we have to know that such a physical deformity was accompanied by debilitating pain. Debilitating pain. And she didn't have Walgreens. Uh, she didn't have the medicine cabinet full of ibuprofen and stuff like that that we kind of have today. We have to remember we're talking about the first century. Okay? And health care was not the same as it is today. Health care was inadequate as best. Water quality was inadequate at best, and this is the reason why in the first century that the average age lifespan of a person was what? 35 years of age. So this is the environment in which Jesus is operating in. Verse 12 through 13. And the Bible says that when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And she glorified God. Now, the wonderful thing about Jesus and the wonderful thing that we have to understand in our own life is that Jesus never turns us away. It doesn't matter how bad we've had of a day. It does not matter what sin we just came out of. Even sin we did knowingly, we are to come to Jesus. I tell my children all the time that you cannot clean yourself. Because what we think in our minds is that, well, you know, I can't really go before God right now. Because look at what I just did. Look what I just thought. Look at how I think. Matter of fact, I have these thoughts while I'm in prayer. But Jesus says, come to me anyway. Because 1 John 1 and 9 says that he is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It says he is faithful. He is faithful. And so what we have to remember is that Jesus does not turn those who come away from him. And so Jesus, in our focus text, he allows his sermon, his teaching to be disrupted. Because why? Because now there's a more important matter in front of him. There is this woman, and he has compassion on her, and he calls her close, and he says, Woman, you are free from your disability. And he places his hands on her by which her life is changed forever. And the Bible says that immediately she stands up straight, and without delay, she enters into worship. Without delay. Why does she glorify God like this? Why does she glorify him? Here's why she glorifies God right away. Because she recognized that a healing did not come by man. She recognized that Satan had nothing to do with it. Or these demonic forces. Remember, the Jews accused Jesus of being under the influence of Beelzebub, the prince of demons, when he did signs, miracles, and wonders. She recognized this is not operating. But rather, she knew and she understood and she experienced that she was touched by the very power of God. And remember why Jesus did signs and wonders. Signs and wonders validated him as the son of God. Remember, he told him, he said, if you don't even believe what I say, believe the works. Believe, watch what I do, and then you will know that I have been sent with the Father, and I am the Son of God. This woman, she experienced what real power looks like. Real power looks like. Because, see, here's the thing. It did not, this real power did not live in king's courts with flowing robes under the applause of men. This power, this power rather, it associated with the weak and the low, and the despised things of the world. This power, it fraternized with tax collectors and sinners. This power, it clothed itself, this is Jesus, with gentleness, lowliness, and compassion. She experienced what real power is. And this is the power 
the kingdom power that Jesus operated in that revealed a God that works to unify and to draw close to us. God is looking to draw close to you through his love, through his likeness, and through divine identity that is granted to us, granted to us without partiality. Without partiality. This is why Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 37, he says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And like this woman, you and I need to be thankful for God every day. That when we, before so we even get out the bed, on our bed, we should be in prayer, thanking God for what we do have. Because in all our lives, we all have kind of a growing list of things that's just not going right. Things that are going wrong. All of us have these lists. Some have more, some have less. Okay? And God does not deny or dismiss that we have challenges and issues. But here's the problem. Sometimes we get so focused on the things that we don't have, right? Like our desires for more money. Our desires for more possessions and stuff. Our desire, desires for a better job, career, and advancement opportunities. Our desire for companionship, right? These things are not evil if they are given to us within the will and the grace and the love of God. There's nothing wrong with these things. But the problem is sometimes we get so focused on what we do have, we lose sight of the important things that God has given us every day, that we should glorify him for every day. Because some of these things I'm going to mention, I tell you what, when these things become, when these things are missing, you start forgetting about these other things that you've been asking for, okay? You know, one of the most important things that you and I should be thanking God for every morning is the breath of life. That you awake because God is merciful. That when you breathe in, you're breathing in mercy and grace every day. That God woke you up this morning so you have another opportunity to face the problems of yesterday. You have another opportunity to take joy in the things that you have pleasure in that he has given you. That these are the things we should be thankful for. We should be thanking God for our health and our strength. Now, we all have different measures of that. Some of us have a little bit more health, others, uh, health, health issues than others. It just depends on where you are in life. But all of us have a measure of health that is operating just fine, that we should be thankful for. Another thing that we need to be thankful for is that God has placed you and I in our right minds. We need to be thankful for that. You remember the man that was inflicted with a legion of demons? Jesus com comes across him, right? He casts out all these demons to a herd of swine, and they go and kill themselves in a lake of water, okay? And the Bible says that the city came out to see this thing that has happened. And what do they notice when he's sitting next to Jesus? This man who had been enslaved by demons, running around half naked, could not be unbound by chains, was now set free set free. And the Bible says he was, he had clothes on and he was in his right mind. We all have emotional and mental things that we're going through, but we have to praise God for the sound mind that we do have every day. Because I tell you, my wife always said, man, when your health and strength is gone, uh, you know, you, you, you appreciate it for some things when you have something which you can work for, that you could get out of bed and do something. You know, my knee may be all jacked up on the right side, but the left one works just fine. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. So we have to remember that there are some things that regardless of the growing list of things that are going wrong, that we should be thankful for. We should be like this woman who gave God the glory without delay as we continue to experience and witness his benefits in our life. This is partly why Paul, when he exhorts Timothy, he says, to first, he says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7 through 8, this is what Paul says. He says, for we bought nothing into the world and we can take no anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. 
I had an old deacon. I was an unsaved person back during this time in my 20s, but I worked projects with this gentleman. He had been a deacon in his church for 30 years, and he used to always talk about the Bible and Jesus, and I just didn't understand why he'd be singing and doing things. I just wanted him to stop talking about it, okay? But I was a non-believer. But I was one of the things about God is that even as a non-believer, when he put his people around you, when the time comes, you can't unhear what God has to say. You can't unhear the gospel singing and the scripture because all those conversations for three, four years came back to me once I received Jesus. But he used to always say one thing. He said, Jason, you ain't never seen a U-Haul behind a hearst. We can't take none of it with us. And so we have to remember those things when we let stuff and desire for certain things to get us depressed and down. Because remember, while some things are not working out, God is still working for your good. I mean, you know, you may not like your house, but guess what? There's a roof over your head. You're not out on the street. Because some people today are out living on the street, living, having to live in their cars. Okay? This is the life that they, they have to deal with. You know, we have to be thankful that there is clothes on your back. Because some people don't really have those. And that there's food in your belly. That there's some basic things that we should glorify God for. You and I should be like the lepers. Remember there were 10 lepers uh, in Luke chapter 17 that was healed by Jesus? And what does the Bible say? Only one came back to give God the glory. We need to be like that leper who realized the wonderful work that God has done. That we are not simply appreciative of God, but we are stunned by his grace and his mercy upon us. And we come to him out of that love and affection because we realize he is our true treasure. And I need Jesus. See, when you and I exercise thanksgiving for God's goodness in our daily life, here's what happens. That, that thanksgiving, that gratitude that we're pouring out to God every day, it lifts us out of the pit of discouragement and it puts out the flames of a complaining and discontented heart. We all got it in some form or measure, but start thanking God for what you have and watch those things begin to get quiet. I didn't say your situation was going to change, but you learn to praise God in the midst of the storm. That's what true joy really is. Amen. Let us continue. So, on the Sabbath, remember, they criticized Jesus for doing these works on the Sabbath. Now, when Jesus heals this woman, his act of love and compassion toward her demonstrated to the assembly, the audience that's around him, what was the right and proper kinds of activities to engage in on the Sabbath. Because remember what Jesus taught about the Sabbath. He said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means essentially this. That God has, the rest he has given us has been divinely instituted by God as a what? As a privilege and a benefit. A privilege and a benefit. Not as a task and a drudgery as the Pharisees hypocritically kept it. And so it was designed for the good of man, not a self-justifying burden as the Pharisees administrated and see, Jesus demonstrated this truth time and time and time again on the Sabbath. Because why? Because Jesus has come to do the works in our lives. And what do you and I do? We rest in those works. Jesus does the works and we rest in them. I love it in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, when Jesus, he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. And once again, he goes in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And the Bible says that he was handed a scroll and he opens up the scroll of Isaiah. And he begins to read the prophetic writings of Isaiah that speaks about him and the works that he's going to do. And Jesus wrote, read of himself, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus has come to do the works in our lives, and we rest in those works. He has come to shoulder the burden of the fallen creation that inflicts us with physical infirmities, spiritual struggles, pains, sorrows, woes, and loss. He has come to shoulder that burden. And this woman who enters the synagogue, she placed her trust 
in this command, which Brother Anthony read earlier. She placed her trust in the fact that Jesus said, come to me. He didn't say some who labor. He said all who labor. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's important because sometimes what happens when we get weary, we get down in spirit, we go try to find our rest in earthly things. We go try to find our rest in earthly vices, things we think give us pleasure, things that we think is going to go on, only to be left thirsty and unfulfilled when we're done with it. But Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And so when Jesus encounters the woman, he places our hands on her, and her healing is immediate, it is complete, and it is permanent. This is the Lord that we serve. And that is the transformative power of God that is not like anything in creation. And this is the reason why we come to Jesus. Let us continue, verse 14 through 16. Verse 14 says, but the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because the Jews had healed on the Sabbath, excuse me, that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? Now, one thing that you can recognize when you read the Gospels and even when you read the book of Acts, and we can see in our own lives, is that when God is being glorified, Satan appears. Satan appears. See, when God is on the move, Satan is not that far behind. And so... You know, so instead of Jesus doing this miracle, and that there, remember, there's an assembly around here listening to him. Instead of there being resounding tears of joy and rejoicing, instead of them joining this woman in worship, what Jesus got to deal with now? He got to deal with the indignation of a synagogue ruler. Why? Because the synagogue ruler, he reacted out of his misinterpretation of the Sabbath command because in his mind, Jesus upstaged him. Okay, he bypassed his authority since this happened in his own synagogue. And out of the abundance of his own heart, his mouth spoke. There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. Now, we know that Jesus exposes his hypocrisy in this way. He says, you, you know, you care for your animals and you look for them, look after them on the Sabbath yet reject an act of compassion on the Sabbath by which God looks after and cares for those created in his actual image. This is the hypocrisy that he's working with, okay? You know, how is it that an animal's needs can be cared for on the Sabbath but not a human being? He said, is a daughter of Abraham, which is a reference to the promised people of God, is a daughter of Abraham of less importance than an ox and a donkey? Okay, this, this is a problem. And so when we read this passage of Scripture, you know, there are some instructions we should gain that helps apply to our modern context. And so here's how I would apply it to now, and this is what we have to think about as a church. When stuff, style of doing things, and traditions become more important than people, we have a problem. We have a problem. I, mean, I worked for the Army a long time, and I remember there was a general, he, he did a leadership class at us one time, and he used to always say this word. He said, he said people before paperwork. This he always tell us. Okay. But when these things become more important, following all this week, more important than people, we have a problem. And remember, Jesus said that Satan bound her for 18 years in this condition. I mean, should God allow this woman to suffer this bondage another day so the Pharisee can validate his own sense of self-righteousness? No. And see, the true issue really is not the woman's healing. That's not the true issue that he's got. The real issue is rather that Jesus is glorified. He is glorified, right? And remember, they were jealous of that. Why? Because when Jesus glorified, what happened? That means the attention and the adulation of men were taken away from them and placed on Christ. They didn't like that. 
You remember, we saw this rear his ugly head at the triumphal entry, right? In Luke 19, remember, Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt, and they're all surrounding the road, praising and worshiping him. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Everybody's worshiping except the Pharisees. What do the Pharisees do? They turn to the disciples and they chide the disciples and say, you know, how, y'all, how can y'all let this thing going on? And how does Jesus respond to that? Jesus is going to get his glory one way or another, even if the very stones must cry out. The very stones must cry out. And so as a Christian, as a person, individually, because you and I go out into the world and we are, we are required and called to go out among people in society to take jobs, to make homes. We're not called to live in this kind of cult-like fashion all in one place as if, you know, this is what's going on. No, we're called to go out in society, to be among people, to get skills, to all these things so that we can mix in society so the spreading of the gospel. But then we also call to be together as a community of faith. And so in both of those realms, we have to ask ourselves in light of our scripture, in light of Jesus' rebuke, is that what are some rules and expectations we keep hypocritically that hinder people from coming to Jesus? What are some rules that we keep hypocritically that hinder people from coming to Jesus or having access to his community of faith? We have to ask ourselves, what are some judgments we make of people that is driven by our own internal deficits? Because we start judging other people because that helps us feel better and higher than people. Where are some of these things in our life that we need God to examine? What are some patterns of Pharisee and envy that are operating in our lives? These are some of the things that we have to ask ourselves when we read these things. Because not only is Jesus' works and what he does for us as we're reading his passage for us, but also his rebuke to the Pharisees, that's instruction for us as well. And so last scripture, verse 17. And so as we know, as Jesus completes his work, it says, as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the people rejoiced at the glorious things done by him. And what we learn about Jesus and what we have to have trust, especially when we're in the midst of trial, especially when we're in the midst of doing things for the Lord and people are coming against us, all these various things. And even though it seems like wickedness is having its way, if we read nothing from this story, remember, God will have the final say. He will have the final say. Because remember, when Jesus rebukes them, it it silences his enemies. Their shame was exposed in the light of his truth. And remember, because that's the truth that we carry. Remember, Paul reminds the church that God's word is not a weapon of this world. But it's of the arsenal, of the armory of heaven. It is given to us from heaven. You know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have what? Divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So now as Jesus rebuked them at this response, the assembly is now rejoicing. They are praising God for his glorious works. They witness a Lord who proclaimed the word. Remember, when they observed Jesus in his ministry, they noticed this one primary thing, that when he preached the word, he preached with authority, not as the scribes. And this is the same Lord that not only preached with authority, but he also did the power and works with the same authority. And for this they now join the hill woman in worship. Why? Because they witness an appetizer of the promise. Live out for those who place their trust in Jesus. And remember, when you and, bring, you and I bring our problems to God, no matter how ugly, how messed up it is, it is an act of faith. This is why Jesus says that if you're going to come to him, if you're going to enter the kingdom of God, you must be like a child. Why? Because child, when they're very little and they make little boo-boos, you know, the nose is all messed up and they got stuff. They just come running in there with all their stuff all over the place because they have no concept. of all they know is that they come into mama because mama got to fix it. Mama got to fix it. I'm a mess. I'm just going to let it be all over me. This is how we have to be with Jesus. Don't try to, I'm going to put a clean shirt before I go. No, come as you are. And Jesus will do the cleaning and change who you are. And so as we close, 
you have to ask yourself, are you coming to Jesus? And I'm not talking about simply non-believers. I'm talking about believers because some of us believers, we think we got it. We think we're good. We get a little worried and we don't realize every day we need God's new graces every day. Every day we have to come before God to get because God gives us what we need day by day. That's the reason why when the Lord's prayer is taught, what does Jesus ask us to pray for? Our daily bread. Not weekly, not monthly. He gives us enough gas for today. And so why do we not come to Jesus? Because sometimes I think it's because we think Jesus is not going to understand. God is not going to understand. And so I think about things. So, for example, we talked about this. Are you suffering physical infirmities? Right? If you're going through physical things. Now, while you and I do all that the medical community, community recommends. Now, remember, our medical community is not perfect more than anything else that we got in this world that God used to provide for us. But the medical community is a means of grace for you and I. But while you and I do all they recommend, Jesus says, come to him. Why? Because does Jesus not understand suffering? Or does he not understand physical suffering? Does he not understand the agony of pain in the body? He does. Because he suffered the whole of it on Calvary. The whole of it. Are you suffering the grief of broken relationships? Come to Jesus. Remember, all abandoned Jesus when he got arrested. All his tight 12, gone. Abandoned him. Okay? And so he knows, you know, even one of his disciples, remember, they betrayed him. And another one de denied association with him so, you know, greatly, he started calling down cursing upon himself. Okay? So Jesus understands what? He understands the isolating pain of fractured relationships. He understands it. Are you suffering in your discouragement and your struggle against indwelling sin? Come to Jesus. Why? Because he knows all too well the strength, the power, and the temptation of sin in our human condition. Why? Because Jesus, you know, when God, does, when God sent Jesus to redeem us, he didn't leave Jesus up in heaven and he just opened up the heavens and gave us the word and said, go and do those good things and you should be saved. But no, this is what God, the Father sent his son down to put on our full humanity. That he will be the perfect high priest that can advocate on our behalf because he understands everything it means to be fully human. He was tired. He was hungry. He know what it's like. Remember, he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And on his 40th day, when he was at the weakest, he understands temptation because that's when Satan came, when he was at his weakest. So he understands the full weight and power of sin. Jesus knows what we're going through. And then lastly, most important, if you don't know Jesus, has he revealed his need, your need for him? Because I remember I got saved later in life. I was 33 before I got saved. Okay. And I heard Jesus in sermons and all this stuff. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Okay. Because I had my own issues and brokes in my life where I felt like God didn't work in it. And so I don't understand this. Jesus, y'all keep talking about this. A good God and a good father and all these different things. You know, where was he when my mother was dying with cancer? When I prayed, probably the only time I ever prayed as a non-believer. And he wasn't there. So I didn't want to hear any of that. And I ran as far as I could from this Jesus as I could. I went all the way to Germany for three years and thought I got as far away from America and this Christianity. Only for Jesus to find me there in a small church in the basement where I got delivered. And it was there in that moment I realized, because the Holy Spirit must begin to work in your life. And show the first thing God showed me was the state I was in. And that I needed him. And I remember, I, I thought about Franklin Graham when he used to do those crusades and stuff like he said at the end, come quickly. And people just rush up to the stage. That's how I was. I was waiting for the pastor to get done so I can get up there as fast as I can. But it's because God showed me my need for him. Okay? You know, and, and uh, that's usually coupled with you coming to the end of yourself. Coming to the end of yourself. Okay, see, you know, are you weary for looking for hope and truth and man-made things only to discover they do not provide lasting peace or future hope? 
Have you sought the answers for your life and everything else only to be left unsatisfied and thirsty for true deliverance? You know, my grandma used to drag me to church all the time as well. You know, the Lord was always keeping me even in my craziness during those years. Okay, those things matter, by the way. And so if you have someone in your life that you're praying for, you drag to, keep praying. Keep dragging them there because it's God that does the change. We participate in following God's will, but God converts. And he will do that in his own time. But she used to take me to church. And I remember the old saints used to always say, have you tried Jesus? Have you tried Jesus in the past? Would you come now? You know, because, and you would see some people to come and you could just tell that they had really come to innocent. They had tried everything else. They know they got nothing else. They got nothing. And that's when God can work. Even as a Christian, when we are, you know, doing things and God is telling us to go in a different way and we like Jonah, we're going to go do our own thing. Okay. But it's when we come to the end of ourselves, it's when God goes, now the training can begin. Now we can begin. And so, have you come to the end of yourself? Have you sought answers and everything else? Have you tried Jesus? Because remember, everything that you and I need that matters in this life, I said that matters in this life, in eternity, is only in him. Come to Jesus. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that... You have not abandoned us, that you have not neglected us, that you have not forsaken us. We thank you, Father, Lord, that you didn't have to all of a sudden make a plan for our redemption. But that your word says that before the foundations of the world, you had hatched the plan for our redemption. Before our first parents ever had a chance to exist or sin, redemption was created in your son, Jesus Christ. So I just pray, for Father, that you would help us to hold fast to this truth, not only as believers, but I pray for those who have not quite, who are struggling, who are resisting your call to come, that you would reach down and you would move their resistance away and that you would soften their hearts and that you would call them as you've called us through your love and your kindness you have drawn thee. And so, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the privilege and honor to be here and to be operating in your grace and mercy. For you, like the woman in our focus text, is deserving all the glory. We pray this prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.